the strongest proposition believed, right, and you determine belief from that, you get all of our conditions satisfied, right? You can see the threshold values that you would use for the right to left direction of the Lockean thesis in that case. So for example, W1, W2, W3, W4, that's a piece stable set, you can use it. W1, W2 is another one, you can use that too. You can't use W1, W2, W3. You can't use a threshold that lies in between these two thresholds, right? Otherwise, logic closure, in particular closure under conjunction, would not be satisfied. Okay. Here's another uh, uh, um, property that you get. So the previous representation theorem actually only needed finite additivity on the probabilistic side. But throw in sigma additivity, right? then what you get is something very nice. Even in the infinite case, if you have p-stable propositions of probability less than 1 at all, they look like this. They are well ordered with respect to the subset relation. Right? So if you know the semantics of conditional logic, Lewisian sphere semantics, it looks like a sphere system. Right, so that's very, very nice, actually. Uh, since this is a well ordering, in such a situation, there will always be at least p stable set of probability less than one, if there is one at all. And that least one <coughs> will give you the most possible beliefs, right? It's the bravest option that you can take, given the probability measure, right? The least set here will give you the most subsets, and that's, that means the most sets that are believed. Here's another example. Uh, so this is my mind, right? I'm very simple minded. I have three possible worlds, that's it, right? My probability measure then lives somewhere in this triangle, right? So the center point being the uniform probability measure giving one over three to each single two sets, right? Being here means assigning probability one to the single set of W1 and so on, right? So each point here is a probability measure. Then I have a threshold like R one half, and then by the theory, um, I can compute the p-stable sets in each of these cases. So for example here, if my probability measure lives here, close to W3, then W3 itself will be a p-stable set. W3 and W2 taken together will be a p-stable set. And taking all of them will be a p-stable set. So there are three p-stable sets here. The bravest option will be the one where I just take W3 as the p-stable set. Okay? So say I'm maximally brave, in fact I am. Okay. Then if my measure is somewhere in this triangle, what I believe is, I will believe W3 to be the actual world. Okay? And if I convey that information, for example, to Hell, right? I tell her, I believe W3 is, is the actual world. Right? Then she will know about my probability measure that Hannes's probability measure is somewhere in here. Right? So belief talk is a coarse-grained way of talking about probabilities, in a sense. Okay? That, that's the outcome. And almost everywhere in the triangle, you get p-stable sets of probability less than one, sort of the interesting case. What happens in the uniform probability case, the only p-stable set is the full set of all worlds. <coughs> sort of in the lottery paradox case, right, the theory predicts that you believe some ticket will be drawn, but you can't believe of any particular ticket that it will not be drawn. Okay. So there's no exciting consequence here, but it's sort of something that seems all right. There is another approach to the same theory, but that starts from conditional belief, even on the qualitative side. And again, the starting point is something that goes back uh, to Pat's work. So Pat was, I believe, the first to observe that if you have a valid argument in the sense of classical logic, right, then if the probabilities of the premises are bounded from below by 1 minus epsilon, and you have m premises, the probability of the conclusion is bounded from below by 1 minus m times epsilon. Right? Um, this was taken up later by Ernest Adams, who I believe was your first PhD student, is that right? Second. Second one? Okay, close enough. Um, uh, and what Ernest Adams did is he generalized that idea to a case where you have arguments that might involve conditionals, right? Um, and their probabilities being given by the corresponding conditional probability. And then he turned that into a probabilistic definition of validity, even for arguments of that sort, which goes like this. Such an argument is valid if and only for all epsilon. There is a delta, so it's like continuity, right? Such that if the probabilities of the premises are all bounded from below by 1 minus delta, the probability of the conclusion is bounded from below by 1 minus epsilon. Right? And this is pretty close to qualitative conditional belief, if you think about it. Right? with a threshold like in the Lockean thesis. 
But it's not quite what I want, because the thresholds differ for the premises and the conclusion. Right? And in a sense, there is no fixed threshold, but you play around with lots of them. Right? But let's take the idea and use in the representation theorem now conditional belief. So I can say something like Z is believed on the supposition of Y. Right? Um, as the bridge principle, I will now use the other direction of the Lockyer thesis, the left to right direction. So it's really, if Z is believed on the supposition of Y, then the corresponding conditional probability is high enough, given by some fixed threshold value in that case. Okay. And then I try to prove a representation theorem again, and again it works. So the following two statements are equivalent. P is a probability measure. Bell, right, which, which is now a class of pairs of propositions, right, it's conditional belief, is closed under logic. Now, what this means now has to be made precise, and this can be done in different ways, and they all amount to the same thing, right? So you can say it's closed under rules that we know from Lewis's conditional logic, or you can say it's closed under rules that we know from non-monotonic reasoning, what people call rational consequence <coughs> relations, or it's closed under the rules of belief revision, right? What's called the AGM theory of belief revision. It all gives you the same thing. You plug that in, that's closure under logic in that case and you throw in the left to right direction of the Lockean thesis. Right? Then an equivalent way of stating that is to say, you take the probability measure, and you pick now a chain of p-stable propositions, and that amounts to the same thing. Right? So if you give me p and bell and the, right to, the left to right direction of the Lockean thesis, right, then bell can really be uh, cooked up from a chain of p-stable propositions. And it also works the other way around. If you have a probability measure, you pick any chain of p-stable propositions, then in this way you get a bell so that all of our postulates are satisfied. Okay. And again, if you fix the second argument on which you conditionalize, then you actually again get the full Lockean thesis. Okay. So you can see it's p-stability again. It amounts to the same uh, theory. So in this case here, for example, I could convey the following information now to Hell. I could say, I believe W3 is the case. I'm maximally brave again. That's what I'm assuming here, okay? But on the supposition that it's not W3, I believe W2 is the case. But on the supposition that it's neither of them, I believe W1 is the case, right? So it's really a sphere system or a ranking of worlds that we have here. If I convey that information to hell, what she knows is that my probability measure lives in that triangle, right? And whatever else I tell her about my qualitative beliefs, it won't help to pin down the probability measure because they all determine the same conditional belief structure, right? So you sort of you get an invariance property like you often get in measurement theory. It's not determined by the usual uh, 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 invariance properties, but it's something like that. Again, talking in terms of conditional belief is coarse grain talking in terms of probabilities, and you get that from the theory. Right? Now, how does this relate to more traditional work on qualitative probability? Um, this is from a uh, uh, paper by Pat, measurement of belief, where he introduces what he calls weak qualitative probability structures. And that's uh, structures that deal with notions like certainty, being more likely than not, being as likely as not, being less likely than not, and being impossible. And he deals with them at, you know, simultaneously. Now, if you look at my first case, where I dealt with absolute belief, that's very close to what, what Pat is doing there. So what I call Bell is very much like Pat's more likely than not. The difference is I allow thresholds to vary with the probability measure, right? Where he sort of fixes it to be one half, right? And that allows myself um, to also have closure under conjunction as being part of closure under logic, which he does not have, right? He has things like uh, if A uh, applies B and A is more likely than not, then B is more likely. Right? So this is part of logical closure, but I also have closure under conjunction. That's sort of the difference. Now, um, the more uh, uh, important case in the literature is the case of what is called qualitative probability structure, which goes back uh, to Definetti. Um, it was observed that these axioms here, although they're very nice, need to be supplemented in order to get a proper representation theorem going, and that was done uh, later by uh, Dana Scott. Now, if you think of my second uh, representation theorem, where I dealt with conditional belief, then underlying this conditional belief structure is really uh, a weak ordering of worlds, which induces a weak ordering of propositions. 
So you can actually compare that situation with the situation here, because that's a weak ordering, a very special kind of weak ordering of propositions or events too. And then you find what the difference is. So what do you have to change here in order to get my representation theorem going? It's the following thing. You take out S4, this S4 axiom, and you replace it by these two conditions. Uh, and in my case, I would read them like this. If A is a superset of B, then A is at least as plausible as B is. Okay. So that's an axiom that they get, too, just by derivation. Okay. But additionally, and that's the main difference, if A is more plausible than B and A is more plausible than C, then in my case, you also have that A is more plausible than the union of B and C. Now, if this ordering here is, was supposed to represent has greater probability than, then an axiom like this wouldn't make sense at all, right? Because the probabilities here, it might be that you have to add the two probabilities of B and C, right, if they are this chop. That's why they don't want an axiom like that here. But if you have a different viewpoint, you come from a logical perspective, and you think of it in a way that this really means the most plausible A worlds right, are more plausible than the most plausible B worlds, something like that, then an axiom like that makes perfect sense. Because the most plausible B or C worlds must either be most plausible B worlds or most plausible C worlds. right? And then you would have that going. Right? So that's the reason. And that's the main difference. And if you plugged it in, um, you get the representation theorem going. Of course, my partial ordering means something else than here. It doesn't mean has higher probability than, but roughly something like is of at least the same probabilistic order of magnitude as, right? which is something more abstract, but that's fine. Um, now, this is an area that I think uh, might become, you know, uh, hopefully, because I'm working on it, um, very interesting to many people. I know other people are working on that too like uh, Kevin Kelly and Hunty Lin at Carnegie Mellon and others. Uh, and if you're successful, then uh, logic and probability might become very good friends. Uh, and if so, um, the way was paved to them by Pat's work. So many thanks and happy birthday to you.